What's everybody? Welcome back to the 585 Report. Mitch Broder here alongside Ryan Sullivan. No longer in the bye week. Bills football is back after a little hiatus. Um, kind of unfortunate, though, that there was no Bills game this weekend because, honestly, I kind of thought, Ryan, it was a sleepy week for the NFL. It wasn't so, you know, I was I was looking forward to just kind of sitting on my ass and watching Red Zone all day, and it was not, I don't know, it was, what, the games just weren't quite there. Well, I got to ask you, you had, I don't know, a oh, barn bur- I don't know if barn burner is the right word, but you had a nine overtime game that hit the under. Uh, how was that? Oh, man. Well, I'm sure that most people enjoyed watching the game, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you this, probably one of the most miserable <laughs> football experiences I've ever had, period. And that's up there because I was there for the 63 Bills Browns game was it 10 years ago so i've seen some some bad bill so some bad football but obviously tough one for the nitty lions and as hop that's so my parents were here uh, for the game oh, so I, no. I sat with them and you know their seats were a little higher up so we were getting pelted with the wind all the elements up there on top of the fact that it was just an ugly game and a penn state loss and a season and it was just man uh, it was good to see my parents, though. I'll tell you that. But it was, oh, what, what a rough you, game that was for, you for know, Nitty Lion it, Nation. It's one of those games you get to look back and like, like the Bills Brown 6 3 game. It's like I was there for a, a nine overtime game that right. went into two point shootouts and was, what was it, 21 to 19 was the final score? 20, 2018. Yeah. 2018. 2018. So it was, yeah, it was, it, it was crazy. I mean, did, at the very least, did see some history because although, I don't think like time wise, like like start to finish, that was the longest game in college football history. But like technically, I guess nine overtimes is the longest game in college football history. So, you know, I'm definitely happy the Bills are back because I could definitely use it after, <laughs> especially because Penn State's playing Ohio State this weekend. So you might as well just chalk that one up for a loss. But we'll see. Anyways, though, you know, bye week. Bills didn't play. Things definitely changed, though. In the AFC, I think that we saw some games, Ryan, that makes you reevaluate this conference. And I'll ask you, was there any one specific game or result or something from this past week that really stood out to you as we kind of got to sit and just observe the rest of this league? This, this is the third time this year where I think a team is going to expose themselves as a paper tiger and end up blowing the doors off someone. The first time the Cardinals played the Rams, like, all right, here's the Cardinals come back to earth game. They're not that team. And they blow the doors off LA. I thought Baltimore, when they went up against Ch- chargers, were going to have a comeback to earth game. And they beat the doors off, say, uh, off the chargers. And then again, this week, I'm like, all right, no way. The Bengals are that team. They, they, they got it a fun defense. Joe Burrow's playing good football but they're not that team and they beat the absolute doors off Baltimore. And it just, this season is just so weird. The AFC is so weird, but the one game when I look at this week and I'm like, that really, I think throws a wrench into everything is the Bengals asserting themselves into the, the AFC North uh, playoff picture as a team who might have a home playoff game in, in the playoffs. No, that that I I was a little bit like you know with you, Ryan. I mean, I I I felt that as though just the way the AFC is kind of playing out, that the Bengals could be competing for a wild card spot. But you're right; they have thrown themselves in the conversation of winning that division. I will go as far as say that they are potentially like a one seed because I do think I still don't know how much faith I have in their head coach Zach Taylor. But man, like. Jamar Chase is freaking special. That guy is already a pro. I mean, you could, he, it, I gotta say, man, those, those LSU receivers, I mean, last year, I know everyone was talking about how Justin Jefferson had thrown himself right out of the gate into the top 10 conversation. And Jamar Chase might even be better than that. I mean, Jamar has been incredible and Joe Burrow has been great for them as well. They have plenty of talent on both sides of the football we're going to see what they are. I mean, I, I, I think that they could absolutely win the AFC North, and I frankly would not be that surprised. 
They're fourth in weighted DVOA right now on defense. That's something you wouldn't not have believed coming into this season. You could have maybe told you a story, told yourself a story that, hey, Joe Burrow take a step up like he has in this offense, which had good pass catchers on them, but has a, had a suspect offensive line and still has a suspect offensive line if we're being honest with ourselves, but has done enough. And it, Joe Burrow is is putting himself in that top tier of AFC quarterbacks. He's averaging 279 yards a game this year. He's averaging nine yards an attempt. And when you have a quarterback playing at that level, it's just hard. It's hard to count them out, even though they have a coach who I think Zach Taylor is one of those guys who can actively get in your way of winning football games. But that all Joe Barrow's got great chemistry with Jamar Chase. T. T. Higgins is really coming along. Tyler Boyd's been there forever. Joe Mixon has been there forever, and he's finally getting to show what kind of running back he is. And it's just, it wasn't the emergence that I was expecting. And I think Nate Geary on Twitter after the game said it best, I, Cincinnati leapfrogging Cleveland as as uh, a contender in the AFC, maybe not for a Super Bowl, but just for in the playoff spots and to make some noise was just not something that was remotely on my radar to start this season. Yeah, I 100% agree. agree. They they have been the, kind of the Cinderella shocker of, of the season so far, and we'll see where they go. We'll see how things where things take them because it is still early in the season. We've seen it so many times where teams get off to these five and two, four and two starts and just evaporate. Um, but they, I mean, they might be free. I mean, we'll see. Listen, at the end of the day, Joe Burrow threw for 400 yards against that Ravens defense on the road. I don't care who you are. That's freaking impressive. But for me, another game, Ryan, that really stuck out to me was the Titans game against the Chiefs. And for two reasons. And I think that for one, the Titans when healthy. I think people did not estimate how good they can be when all their main guys are there. Yes, they lost to the Jets. This is not the same team that played against the Chets. That was a team that didn't have Julio, that didn't have A.J. Brown, that was missing some pieces on their defense. They're starting to get healthy, and you're seeing now two weeks in a row what that team looks like when all the pieces are there. And I think that, on the other hand, Kansas City, I think, is frankly way worse than anyone really thought. And I feel like, you know, with with Kansas City, I feel like I'm sort of waiting, or at least a lot of people have been waiting for them to sort of reassert themselves back as that like dominant team that we're used to seeing. And at this point at three and four, I don't know if we're going to ever really see that from them. I mean, I I'm not really so certain that they're even going to be in the playoffs at the end of the season. If they'll even be in the conversation for a wild card. I mean, as of right now, this, I mean, they're, they're a below 500 team and that's the course they're on. And, I think that for the Bills fans, you know, on one hand, that Titans loss on last week, I think you say, listen, we lost to a legitimately a very good football team. But that Chiefs win, I think, is starting to lose its its um, validity because the Chiefs are clearly just not a very good team right now. Here's their next six games. Home against the Giants, but then they have Packers, Raiders, Cowboys, Broncos, Raiders again. And then the Chargers, so that's eight games. There's not a ton of easy games in that schedule. And and I was kind of someone who fell in, even as the Bills went in and beat them. This is a team I was like, they're going to get better. They'll be fine. Their offense is clicking. I think Steve Fagnolo is an experienced defensive coordinator who will figure it out. But he hasn't. And, you know, I think a lot of the numbers guys who like to use uh, turnover-worthy plays as a statistic kind of are getting to eat their cake this week in terms of Mahomes has always been up there with Josh in turnover worthy plays. And now this year, a lot of those turnover worthy plays are becoming turnovers. And he's also not getting a ton of luck with some of the throws, right? The Tyree kill interception. And there's been a, a couple batted ball interceptions, but he's, this is the first time it seems like he's really Pat Mahomes and this version of the chiefs have really faced adversity. I know Kelsey was on those Travis Kelsey was on those Alex milk chiefs that went in and, and lost like the second biggest playoff lead of all time in Indianapolis a bunch of years ago. 
but this version of the Chiefs hasn't really faced this adversity. And it's clear, you know, I I, th- I still think their offense will be fine. I think I think us as Bills Mafia are having a little bit too much fun in in uh in the Patrick Mahomes regression bandwagon. He'll be fine. He's still a really good quarterback, but that defense is just uh, atrocious. And I I don't know how you get better on that defense with the secondary they have and even even their front seven like outside of Chris Jones Frank Clark's getting paid a whole lot to do nothing the the one of the keys in the middle of that defense is Nick Bolton who's not playing super well so it's it's hard at this point to see a path for them to get better but it's also Pat Mahomes so who knows you know they they could always get on a run but they have a really hard path and Tennessee now seems like that team that want that if you want to get to the playoffs, that's a team the Bills are going to have to beat. That's a team that they're going to have to play in the playoffs. Would is that the team that now, when you look at this conference, Mitch, that the Bills are maybe not have to go through in the same sense as last year, but is that is that the Bills' main competition for that first of the Super Bowl? It, it, it very well could be just because. And I was telling this to a friend, you know, with the Titans, because people don't look at them as that kind of elite Super Bowl contender as, say, teams like Buffalo or Baltimore or the Chargers. But they have a lot of just, for lack of a better term, just special players. I mean, their offense, sure, they have some flaws. Their own line's not great. Tannehill's not amazing. But you have the best running back in football in Derrick Henry. You have two complete physical studs at receivers in Julio Jones and in AJ Brown and then on their defense. Like Jeffrey Simmons is a fantastic player. Kevin Bayard is a fantastic player. Like they have so much playmaking ability that they can kind of turn a game at any, any point on either side of the ball. So listen, they're definitely up there with one of the teams that if you're Buffalo, they're one of your biggest competitions at the end of the day, they beat you. They beat you. They have a head to head tiebreaker over you. So as far as I'm concerned, that's a team that is absolutely in in competition with Buffalo and one that they are going to have to be ready to potentially face in January. Yeah, and, you know, and I think part of it is, I, I think I've probably been the driver of this train is I constantly, constantly, constantly doubt Ryan Tannehill. And he constantly puts up numbers, does well in the box score generally. He didn't have a great box score game against the Bills, but he did enough. And he constantly kind of just finds ways to do enough, whether it's pretty or not and doesn't get a ton of respect from guys like me who still view him sometimes I think as Miami Ryan Tannehill and he's just he does a really good job of driving that ship and for all the problems and that's the the reason why I I had I had KC plus four or minus four and a half in that game because I didn't think there was a world where Tennessee secondary could play with Patrick Mahomes, the Christian Fulton, Caleb Farley, that whole secondary is out, man. And I, they they finally, I guess, have enough push up front in their front forward. And, and Buffalo was kind of, I guess Buffalo may have been their awakening where Harry Andre and Dupree and Jerry Simmons are maybe a good enough defensive line that mask deficiencies on the back end that they have. And, you know, we, we've seen if there's anything that's a kryptonite to Josh. And I mean, maybe it's not even fair to say that because it's a kryptonite to any quarterback. If you can get pressure with four, it doesn't really matter what you have in the back end because that can that can disrupt your game plan. And so, I mean, those were the two big games. Are there any other little notes or nuggets or things that you just saw throughout the week, whether it's AFC or NFC, that that made you perk your ears up or something you're paying attention to going forward? For me, there were two other things that stuck out to me. One was that, and this is just kind of interesting, feels like the Raiders have gotten better now that John Gruden is no longer their head coach because they've come out and played two really good games. I know the competition wasn't great, but, you know, they're fascinating and they're definitely a team that's in the playoff mix. I don't think they win that division just because it's such a good division, the AFC West, but they're an interesting team. And then, you know, I kind of just put the bottom here. Pats and Colts are not dead yet and are very much hanging around. I don't think either of those teams are winning their divisions. I think that for the Colts, the Titans are leaps and bounds better than they are for the Patriots. The Bills are leaps and bounds better than they are. But as far as being wildcard teams, 
they're not out of it because right now that last wild card spot, like that seven seed, as of right now sitting here in, in, in week eight, it's kind of wide open because the AFC's got, in my opinion, Ryan, six really good teams and a bunch of not so good teams. So they they their their seasons are very much alive. I don't know about you. I don't know if you had any things similar to that. Yeah. Mac Jones, I memed really hard when he was drafted. <laughs> and it's not just because he looks like a doofus when he walks. It, I just didn't think there was a way for him to succeed with his skill set. I think his floor, it's apparent that his floor is a lot higher than he, I thought it was. And when things are going well like, around him, he can drive that. He can, I'm not going to say drive the ship, be a part of that chip. And he can, he can be a cog in that machine that works. He doesn't have arm strength. He doesn't have mobility. He's not going to do a thing that other quarterbacks can do. But if you're in positive game script, if you're ahead of the sticks, if you're, if your defense is playing well, he can keep your team on the tracks. He's got God tier accuracy for all his other limitations. So I, I I'm not going to say it was wrong because I really don't think his ceiling is that much higher. I don't know where Mac Jones goes from here, but he's helped that team more than I thought it would. And you know, we, we can meme Bill Belichick and his inability to, to scout wide receivers and giving John o. Smith $50 million. And, but he's still Bill Belichick and that defense, he's still coaching that defense. And, you know, at three and four, you know, they're, they're both going to be teams that, are going to be hanging around the bottom of that CBS in the hunt uh, right. tracker you know, I, pretty late into the year. Right. Now, I will say this, though, with Mac Jones and the Patriots, I, 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 I do hate to kind of play this card, but their three wins have been against the Jets twice and the Texans. So I, I do want to see them beat a, a, a real quality opponent at some point here that's not – picking in the top five doesn't need to be the best team in the league. Just someone who's, who's formidable. Um, but no question though, Mac Jones, like you said, I mean, I, I agree with you. I still don't think his high end ceiling is really there. I just don't think he's ever, he doesn't have anything he does particularly special, but no question. He, he can play in the NFL. He's a starting caliber quarterback, which I guess is kind of what people said of him in the pre-draft process. And, and, and we're seeing that now, but as we are kind of at this midway point, Ryan, if you were to power rank the top seven teams in the AFC, roughly what a playoff picture would sort of look like, what would that look like for you? Starting from, we'll go, we'll start from the bottom to the top. Starting from at the seven top, up. So I, I have them in two tiers and the bottom one, two, three, four, the bottom five are all in a tier of their own because I think you could tell me, you could convince me about any order of them give or take a couple teams, but I have KC is my last team. And I just, I, I, even though we just kind of trashed him, I don't, I have a hard time not believing Pat Mahomes and Andy Reid are going to figure out something to at least get that seventh seed, which if KC is the seventh seed, it really will. Or if KC is a wild card, it really ups the ante to, or the ups the stakes to get that one seed this year. Cause if KC can get out a run and they have to be a six seed or seven seed, I don't know if that's a team you want to play in the playoffs, even at home. Um, so I have Casey as my seven, Chargers as my six. Uh, you know, I, I think probably the second best quarterback out of the second tier of teams, Baltimore as my fourth, Bengals as my third, and maybe that, that might be because they came off a really hot game. And then I have Raiders as my third, which I didn't think I was going to have them, but I think they've played, you know, everyone on this list kind of has bad losses the bears have been both the teams in this list which is kind of weird both both the Bengals and the raiders have weird losses against the bears but i think they are the teams right now that are just kind of playing the best football together and then and then i think it's a pretty wide margin to the next two teams and i really go back and forth on this i almost went 1a 1b and i'm gonna put Buffalo at two, even in my heart, I think they're the better team, but I think for the sake of intellectual honesty and just, you know, whatever, they beat them. They, it was seven yards, but they beat them. I'll put Buffalo second and Tennessee first. Now, the difference in this year 
as opposed to last year where Buffalo was the clear two, is that this isn't last year where, yeah, Buffalo's the two and Casey's the one, but Casey smacked the shit out of you when you played. And then you, this is a situation where, sure, Buffalo, you can put Buffalo two, whatever, but you lost, you won by seven yards. They were seven yards away from winning that game. So I'm not particularly concerned about playing them again. Will it be a close game? Yes. But this isn't a situation like last year where I Buffalo needs to change everything they do before going in to play Tennessee again. So I any once again, it's a really mixed group, but I, I think those are the two groups. And I think Buffalo and Tennessee are pretty far and away the better two teams in, in this conference. Yeah, I mean, I think that at the end of the day, we don't have that one dominant team in the AFC. There's a lot of very good teams, and maybe one will emerge when it's all said and done. But as of right now, I mean, I feel like you could have this list in so and, and, and a multitude of different orders and completely makes sense. But for me, starting kind of from the bottom up to the top, so at the seven, I have the Browns just because I, I feel like once they get fully healthy, that will be a good team. Right now, they're missing Hunt. And Chubb, Baker's banged up. Jarvis Landry just came back from injury. Odell's been banged up. Like they just haven't been healthy all together. And I still want to see what they look like when all of those guys are together on the field. And their offensive line's been banged up too. They just they've just been hit, bit by the injury bug on offense, which was definitely going to be the driving force of that team. So I still have faith that they will be a good team and be in the playoffs. I have the Raiders at six. Um, Chargers. I have them at five. Have the Bengals at four. Even though the Ravens did just lose them, I just have more faith in, in John Harbaugh over Zach Taylor. And I, I think that was kind of what I why I picked them. Uh, I have Bills and Titans in the top two as well. And just like you, I actually have Titans at one and Bills at two. And I agree though. I do think Buffalo is overall a better football team. But for right now, just because the Titans are kind of playing some of the best football out of anybody over these past two weeks, I think I'll just give the Titans the nod. But that's kind of my top seven. I would have had KC probably at eight, right behind Cleveland. But again, this whole list is such a toss up, and you could you could tell me, you know, a, multi, a multitude of different orders, and I and I and I would understand. I almost made a tier. I because I think Browns are in that same tier as Raiders, Bengals, Baltimore Chargers, Chiefs. I, mm-hmm. I think they're all in that. I think the Browns are in that tier of teams. Because then after that, because I also have my notes, I just kind of went through my next tier. Because I think the tier after that I have is where I have Colts, the Colts and the Pats. And I, I think those are the three significant groups. And it, it really is, you know, not to believe at the point, but it really is an up for grabs year. And it, I, I tweeted out right at the games. This has been a really weird year. And it, it feels like parody is in, in full effect. No, absolutely. I mean, now as a football fan, I mean, just going to make it more fun once all these, you know, once all the dominoes fall and that we see where everybody is. But yeah, no, at at the end of the day, I mean, between those eight teams that we we talked about that that we consistently kind of have in this top half of the conference, they all at least have something that's really good that they do or they have the position group that's really, really good and loaded. So it's going to be fun to see how it all kind of settles and and where everything goes. But Again, there there's so much time, so many games still have to be played, especially with that extra week. And we could see a team come from you know the bottom and rise up into the playoff picture. And we could see one of these teams we've been talking about as a potential threat to the Bills with the one seed completely just fall apart and miss the playoffs all you know uh, completely. So it's it's going to be interesting to see where this all where this all kind of settles and where this goes. And if if you're listening to this and you're concerned, well, is Buffalo going to lose the one seed? Are they going to have to play Kansas City as a wild card team? Are they going to not get that by? Buffalo has a real chance to separate themselves. They almost have no excuse not to over the last 11 games. This is from Thad Brown a couple days ago. Bills have 11 games left. Two teams are above 500. The other, the Bucks, which Bucks are good. And the Saints, which you just saw the game the Saints played against uh, Geno Smith-led Seahawks. Uh, the AFC combined opponent record is, or the combined record of all these teams are 28 and 43. 
you want a path to that number one seed. You want a path to, to being the number one team in the power rankings. It's handling business in all these games. And it starts this week with a Miami team coming off two very embarrassing losses. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we can get right into it because the Miami Dolphins are just. It's man, they they have been. I think you can make the argument they've been the most disappointing team in football this season for a team that had such high expectations. I mean, there were people that really thought in the preseason that this could be a team that wins the AFC East and takes it away from Buffalo. And that is just not has not been the case at all. They're one in six and everything's kind of falling apart for them. So Ryan, what, what have you seen from Miami? Because we played them week two, right? Where, you know, no one really knew what the dolphins were going to look like. What has been the biggest thing you've seen sort of change about them? Also, I'm going to be right back real quick. You can talk, but I'll just be right back. Okay. So there's two things that are the biggest thing that I've noticed is that this team was supposed to be all about their defense, right? This team, that was all the headlines. They've got, they had turnovers in a million straight games. I think it ended a couple games ago. And we watched that first game that Buffalo didn't play well, but they played, but they won 35 to nothing. And we're like, oh, Josh didn't have a great day, but it was a good defense and we'll figure it out. Well, now this defense is 26th in DVOA, 19th in pass DVOA. And it's kind of weird that the offense struggled in this game. And, you know, I I think that's where this team has really gone off the rails. I don't think anyone thought this offense that Miami had was going to be this elite offense, but it's the storyline and everyone wants to focus on two and we're going to get into two in a couple minutes, but it's just been the absolute collapse of this defense and their inability to, I mean, look at, look what happened in that game on Sunday where they had the game one two of one on a game winning drive. And they just let 97 year old Matt Ryan walk down the field and get in the field goal range. So it's this defense has just been, incredibly incredibly underwhelming in a unit that was supposed to carry them yeah the defense has has been so disappointing and i think that you know someone brought it up about this dolphins defense i i i, I want to give credit to someone i just can't remember but they were saying you know the dolphins at the end of the day and of course hindsight's 2020 but the way they won last season was just frankly very unsustainable they they just feasted off their defense forcing turnovers and that just doesn't always you know stand up and i mean sometimes you just don't get any turnovers and it's and and so it's just been yeah their defense just hasn't been at that level but for me i think the thing that has changed has been what people think of brian flores you know coming the season people were so high about brian flores could he be coach of the year people wanted him to be Thought he could be coach of the year a season ago. And I feel like now, here we are sitting here in week eight, it feels like Brian Flores is just not viewed in the same light. He's really botched his offensive coordinator situation now. Three, I mean, he's been there for three years, and there's been a new OC all the every three years. And I think right now they have co-offensive coordinators, and it's just kind of that's kind of a disaster. Um, the defense, which is his baby at the end of the day, has been pretty darn subpar. And I think the biggest telltale sign with Flores as far as why I think it's changed and why I really don't know if he'll be there next season has been, and we'll, again, we're going we're gonna to talk about this in a minute here, but I think the last two weeks have been the best you've seen from Tua. The best they've gotten from him by far. I actually think he's played reasonably well, and they still lost those games against two pretty bad teams, to say the least, in Jacksonville and Atlanta. So I just think that, at the end of the day, they're just a kind of a poorly coached football team. They make bad mistakes. They get, you know, untimely penalties. I, I just have been so unimpressed with Brian Flores, who's someone who I actually really did think pretty high, highly of coming to the season. But it, I mean, I, I don't know what to say. They just, they're, they're, that team is just not coached well, to be honest. And, and not only that, it it's bordering 
dumpster fire territory. I mean, let's talk about this quarterback situation for a second. And I won't go into in the weed too much into the weeds, but everyone's seen the reports where there's smoke, there's fire. This is a team that's looking at Deshaun Watson. And regardless of what they say, regardless of of what uh, what's coming out of Chris J- or whatever they're oh Stephen Ross and what's coming out of Chris Greer, what's coming out of Brian Flores. This is a team that you would imagine that seems like by because it's not just the Houston Chronicle report. It's been a lot of it's been Mike Florio. It's it's been a, coming from a lot of different places that this team has legitimate interest in, in a quarterback with twenty plus sexual assault allegations. What does that tell them about the confidence in your quarterback? What message does that send to your locker room? It's not great. And getting away from that, because I don't want to get bogged down there, because that's a real type of show that we are. But Tua, th- there is, I think, Bills fans, I think myself included, I sometimes stoke this fire. The, Tua has not been bad the last two games. He had some very bad interceptions in both games that were not pretty, but he has not been bad. He hasn't been great. But the last two games, he's been over 290 yards in both games. Over a 70% completion percentage in both games. Over, I think, a 94 rating in both games. And he played at a level that you can win with. He just isn't playing a level you can win because of right now. His, his yards per attempt is still around 23rd in the league, which isn't great. But he hasn't been bad. And I, I think really the telling thing on this offense and what the issues are in this offense, even more so than the struggles of Tua, is just the way they're operating this offense. You know, they get Jalen Waddle to be a field spreader. They get Jalen Waddle as a guy who can be a deep threat. And right now he's just fast Jarvis Landry. He has 44 catches for 384 yards. For context, Diggs has 37 catches for 436 yards. And Jamar Chase, who we gloat about on this show a second ago, <laughs> has 34 catches for 754 yards, someone they could have drafted if they didn't trade out of that spot. So it it's a really weird offense, but I don't think know if it's totally fair to label Tua the problem in this offense. No, absolutely not. I I I think that you put the offense on frankly, they're like I mentioned their offense their their OC situation has been a train wreck for two years now. Um, and their offensive line. I mean, people listen to Tua coming out of college, right? Like the, what the scouts were saying about Tua was that like, he's not the most physically gifted quarterback, but if you can just keep him clean in the pocket and give him enough weapons, he can, you know, be a very productive quarterback. And the Miami dolphins, despite the resources they have poured into that offensive line, they have flopped. All the you know the the, the draft picks they've used on an O lineman, the money they've spent, it just their O line is still arguably the biggest weak link, or the weakest link uh, on their on the team. So, as much as Tua has not been amazing, I don't think you people could expect Tua for who he is to be come in and and, and be like Kyler Murray because that's never who he was going to be. So, I agree with you, Ryan. I think. Tua has, at the very least, you could say this about Tua for the, the past two weeks. He has played more than well, more than good enough for the Miami Dolphins to at least win one of those games. Yeah, it, it, you know, Joe Burrow doesn't have elite arm strength either. I think people try to harp on Tua's arm strength. Joe Burrow is not someone who really wins with arm strength. I think the comp, and maybe not the comp's the right word because one's a Hall of Fame quarterback, one's a rookie. But I think what people saw in Tua was kind of a left-handed Drew Brees, someone who can really just be efficient, pinpoint, and make throws he needs to throw. And it doesn't seem like the offense is putting them the offensive coordinators, which I think is part of the issue. You know, they say if you have two quarterbacks, you don't have a quarterback. Maybe if you have two OCs, you don't actually have an OC, right? And it, I. You know, I, I took a lot of flack on Twitter this year or this offseason saying, hey, maybe let's not count two out. And he makes some big time throws and you see where he's he's best is you watched early part of these games, especially when they're in their their first 20 scripted plays. 
they have bread and butter plays for Tua. Tua is really good at hitting those timing routes. And, you know, when he has Gasicki in stride, when he has Waddle in stride, and he can get those, you know, one, two steps and then out throws, those work really well for this offense. The issue is if you like, almost like Mac Jones, if you can't keep your offense ahead of the sticks and you can't keep your offense moving and in positive game script situations, it, they make it very, very hard on him to win. And it's sometimes, you know, it, it's hard to decipher what the real issue is because sometimes it's, you know, it, it's, we're not Kendall and Clay. I, I, I'm not, I don't have that acumen to break down the tape, but it, it's an all around issue with this offense. And it, it, it's, I don't know where they go. I don't know how this offense gets better from where they are outside of blowing up the coaching staff and, and starting over, which it's hard when you have a quarterback going into his third year next year. Absolutely. Yeah. They, Dolphins, yeah, they just it just hasn't been their year, and it, it really is amazing, you know, with these teams out. You know, the, people say it's a week to week league, and it's kind of a year to year league too, because some of these teams just kind of come and go and rise and fall faster than you know it. And the Dolphins certainly kind of feel like that team. But Ryan, for you know, we're looking at this game on Sunday for Buffalo again, coming out of the bye on Halloween in Buffalo. You know, we can assume that the Bills. I mean, listen, they're 13 and a half uh, point favorites in this one, unless uh, Vegas has changed that line. I, I, I'm not sure they have, but the last I checked, it was that high. So we'll just say if the Bills win, which appears to be likely, what do you need to see from this team? Uh, aside from just the result of, of this game to make you feel a bit better as we sort of head into the thick of things this season. It's funny because I remember that second week, what was the storyline? Yeah, we won 35-0, but it didn't really feel that good. Josh didn't play well. The offense was kind of janky. And it, it, we just, no one really felt great coming out of that game, besides the fact that we could hang our heads on and say, well, we we didn't play good, but we won 35-0. I think for this game, for us to feel good, it, maybe this, is, this sounds silly, but you want to go out there and you want to dominate. You want Josh Allen to have a clean game, efficient game uh hell let's have another let's have a 300 yard josh allen game let's have a four touchdown josh allen game and a game where we see the josh that we expect in games against miami the josh that dominates miami i think that's what you want to see i think we want an offense that finishes in the red zone an offense that can run the ball well and i think we we want you know you talk about get right games and you know, I think to really get right after this game, it it all falls on the offense. I don't really the defense will be fine. What the heaven on the defensive ball doesn't concern me all that much. I want to see this offense finish drives, be efficient, and, and have another thirty five point game and look good doing it. I think the I this is a game where I think the eye test will matter and how we assess the Bills going forward. Yeah, I mean, I I think for this team what. There's two things I want to see happen. I think I need to see them throw their red zone offense. I know this is not a good defense, but I need to see that red zone offense look back to, you know, how we saw it a year ago. I mean, they haven't been great this season, scoring touchdowns, finishing drives. I want them to kind of show to me that this is not going to be an issue for this team moving forward, that it's just kind of been a weird little trend for them for a minute. And I kind of want to see this defense get their swagger back a little bit. You know, they allowed 34 points. Got ran over by King Henry a couple times. Struggled in the second half of that Titans game greatly. I mean, we talked about it. They allowed scores, I think, on six straight drives in that game. And this is still a unit that I believe is very good. I think most people would agree that this is still a top 10 defense. Uh, and I, I think that, I mean, yes, they're playing against an atrocious offense. But, you know, they need to make it look like they're playing atrocious offense, just like they did week two when they when they shut out this the same Dolphins team. I need to see them go in there. And take care of business, just like how you said. They're, 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 we're talking about a team that is a Super Bowl contender at home against a win-win team, and it needs to look like that. I think on Sunday. Yeah, it, I think you said it exa exactly right. It's, I, I think the kind of game we want to avoid. Remember last year we wanted a get right game, and then we went into the Jets and we won like eighteen to whatever it was, and 
No, we didn't get a touchdown. That's what it was. We didn't get a touchdown. And everyone just kind of felt kind of icky about it. Right. And that's what you don't want. And I, I don't know there's how many more ways we can say dominate, but I, I think that's it. When the Bills have done it through the first half of the season, you know, we can sit here and we can pontificate about, oh, what does the schedule mean? How much do these wins mean? How much does can you know, how much does the Kansas City win mean? How much do these next 11 games really tell us about this team? I think it tells you a lot about a team when you dominate the teams you're supposed to dominate. If you can, you know, you see teams, you know, this is such a weak league team. You see teams of lesser teams that'll go up against teams like the Dolphins and go up against bad teams. Christ, Tennessee lost to the Jets. It, you, I think it speaks a lot to your team if you dominate the teams you're supposed to dominate. And at the end of the day, that's what that that's what we want to see this week. Absolutely. And I, people have to remember, you know, uh, with these losses, like, again, this is the NFL. It's the National Football League, you know, any given Sunday. I know it's such a cliche, but you, you just, you know, you, you never know. And again, hopefully the Bills come out on Sunday and, and, and take your business in front of the home fans. How about, Ryan, is there anyone on Miami that you're specifically kind of keeping an eye out for? Because they do, uh, although we have kind of been dogging them for a while, they do have some very good players on the roster, which made people think that they could be a legit playoff team heading into the season. So any guys you have your eye on heading into Sunday? I mean, I talked about him a second ago. I mean, Jalen Waddle, he's having an okay year. I, I you know, I, I think about him through the lens of if we had a Bills rookie wide receiver on that pace, we'd probably be pretty, pretty happy with it. But someone who they put themselves in position to draft and, and, has unique skills that they haven't used to his full ability yet. And I'm just constantly, I'm still looking to see if they can finally use him in the correct ways. We even talked about pre-draft how he's with, and with Kevin, that he's probably one of the functionally fastest wide receivers to come out of the draft in a long time. And so he's someone that I'm looking to see if Miami can get going in, going in a positive way. And then the other guy I have, who I think I literally have in my notes every single time we play Miami is Mike Gesicki. It seems like every time I watch Miami and Mike Gesicki makes a catch, he doesn't. He never makes a five-yard catch. He never makes a 10-yard catch. Every time Mike Gesicki makes a catch, it's like a 20 or five-yard catch down the field. Mike Gesicki doesn't make small plays. Mike Gesicki only makes catches in chunks. And he, for, for one reason or another, finds ways to, to give Buffalo fits. So I want to see if maybe some of the lessons Buffalo learned from taking Travis Kelsey out of the Tennessee game, they can put in the finally figuring out how to stop Mike Kosicki. Yeah, I, I had Kosicki many notes as well. And, you know, he's he's a guy that's a tough cover. He's so athletic for that tight end position. has got just such great hands. And, yeah, he's given the most problems. Seems Seemingly every time they play him, he has a good game. Another guy I'm adding to the list now, albeit I know he is a little banged up, and we'll see if he goes this Sunday. But, you know, Xavier Howard is a guy that is still an elite shutdown quarter. You know, don't get it don't get it twisted with this dude. I mean, you know, he picked off Josh Allen in that Week 2 matchup. Um, this is a guy that led the league in interceptions a season ago. He's not to be messed with at all. And although he's just one player and he's a corner, I don't know how much you could truly change – this game necessarily, but let's just say Miami hangs around and it's a closer game than we think, uh, you know, he's a big play waiting to happen. So that's a guy that, you know, Josh Allen and that, and that offense is going to have to know where he is at all times because he he's the real deal and he's proved it year in and year out in his career. Well, and let's frame it this way too with Xavier and Howard. I think there's slowly been a clamoring of Bills fans who – Want to see Diggs have a a twenty twenty s game? We want. I think that the Clamory fans that want to see a uh, hundred and fifty yard two touchdown Stefan Diggs game, especially when we see Jamar Chase and Cooper Cup having these type of games. And you know, to these fans' credit, he hasn't quite had that game. I think he's only above a hundred yards one game this year, but he's still on pace for if this was a 16 game season, I think he'd be on pace for around 1200 yards. If I have that correct. And I think he's on pace for 1300 yards in, in a 17 game season. So he's, he's putting up number one production. He just hasn't quite had that. Holy shit game yet. And I think 
that's that's something you do want to see going at some point. He is your alpha. He is your number one. And he has had some of his best games or, or his best one of his best games last year came against the Dolphins. So I think Xavier Howard is absolutely someone to watch. And he, I almost put him in my notes of things I want to see of guys that I want to see kind of pop off and Diggs has done that against Miami. So I, I think that's absolutely a mess up to watch as I'm sure, you know, I, I know Diggs says, you know, he says all the right things to the media. He, he doesn't care his numbers. If he doesn't win, he doesn't care about what, what catches, you know, his stat line, as long as the bills are doing what he wants, the bills are going where they want to go. But, I think he deserves. I, I I think it's always good to feed your star player. So watching that matchup is definitely something I'll be doing as well. All right, we've broken down the matchup, and it's time for the moment I am sure everyone's been waiting for: score predictions in this game. Ryan, what do you have? I have thirty-eight seventeen. The game that's never really close. Sean McDermott. You saw it, Buffalo Fanatics put the tweet out today. It's 4-0 coming out of bye weeks. This is a team that is going to be really pissed off after that, after the, the Titans game before the bye. The Bills really have Miami's number over the last they've won. They're on five straight wins now. This will be six straight wins. Yeah, this will be six straight wins if they win today. And it... I don't see a way Miami gets in this game. Two is going to, they're going to fall behind early. Two is going to try to do too much. He's going to throw another one or two of those bad picks. And this defense just doesn't have the firepower to run with Josh. And Josh will go back and have another one of his, his classic Josh Allen against Miami games will have a uh, whole win his, what is it? 11th uh, AFC player of the week against the Miami Dolphins. I know it's not 11th. But um, so the game is ever close, 38-17, and everyone has a, a wonderful Sunday memeing the Dolphins on Twitter again. Yeah, I, I'm someone who doesn't like to always predict upsets, or not upsets, um, excuse me, uh, blowouts, rather, just because you never know. And uh, But that being said, uh, this game, I, I agree with you, Ryan. I don't think this game's going to be all that close maybe in the beginning Miami hangs a little tough just because it is a divisional rival you know they they do want to go out there and try to save their season but they are just not a good football team there's kind of nothing else to say so I have the Bills winning 41 to 20 I agree I think Allen has a good game this one uh and I actually think Cole Beasley is a guy that that has a really good game for them especially with Dawson Knox now out out, I'm gonna really easily to be that you know chain mover for them across the middle. So yeah, Buffalo 41, Miami 20 is my prediction. Yep. That's, I, I don't think there's much more to say. Do what you're supposed to do. Buffalo is an elite team. Do what elite teams do. Absolutely. So that about does it here for the 585 report. We thank you so much for listening and for your continued support. And please, 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 please check out everyone's work on all Across you know the networks for for BF whether that's podcast or or articles or you're just interacting on social media wh- whatever it might be we all really appreciate it uh, it's been a lot of fun this season it's only going to get more uh, fun with that so for Ryan Sullivan I'm Mitch Broder thank you guys so much for listening have a great rest of your day. <laughs>